Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I am so personally thankful and grateful for the plan of redemption that was laid before the foundation of this world. Dear Father and I just pray in a very special way that you would please give us wisdom and understanding. I pray that you please be with my mind and my heart. Dear Father, that you will bring to remembrance everything that you have communicated to me. Dear Father, I pray that the weakness and feebleness of who I am and my utterance, the Lord will not detract from the power of this message. And I pray, dear Father, that you be with all those who are watching online currently, those who uh, may view this message at a later date. I just pray that none of the efficacy of this uh, may be lost through that translation. And I just pray that you would please keep us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the title for our study this evening is very, uh, very important. Very, very important. And there are many things in which the Lord is desiring to communicate that if we rightly understand uh, will help to greatly influence uh, not only our present circumstances, but also our eternal destiny. And as I was uh, preparing uh, this message for this evening, uh, I was really praying that the Lord would really give us a proper understanding of not only this, but also its far-reaching ramifications. Now, when you see this uh, picture, what do you think of? Thirst. Yeah, so we think of thirst. We think of thirst. Now, is it possible to live without water? No. No, it's not possible to live without water. Now, generally speaking, how long can you survive without consuming at least some form of liquid? Yeah, roughly about three days. Roughly about three days, you can survive without actually consuming some type of liquid beverage. Now, in a spiritual sense, how long can you survive without receiving spiritual water? Not long at all. Now, we're going to find out what this spiritual water is. Now, the, the subject matter for our study for this evening is entitled The Living Water. The Living Water. Water, And what we're actually going to find out this evening is that the entire world is suffering because they do not have the living water. They do not have the living water. Now, as Christians, we are fortunate in the sense that we have access to this living water. But what's an even sadder reality is that the vast majority of people who profess to be Christians do not even have the living water themselves. And so, so many of us who claim to be followers of Christ come in contact with people who are literally dying, both physically and spiritually, and because we ourselves are so destitute, we literally have absolutely nothing to give to them. And so we're going to study the subject this evening called the living water, the living water. Now, what is this? This is the puzzle of depression, the puzzle of depression. And when I, when I saw this picture, I thought that this was so fitting depicting the state of mental health in the world today. Now, is mental health a serious subject in the world today? Yeah. It's a very serious subject. And in light of us studying this subject of living water, we're actually going to find out that this subject of depression and mental health is simply an absence of this living water. If people had access to the living water that God is trying to give, and not just access, but if they took the step in actually drinking that living water, there would be no such thing as depression. Or if we were besought by depression, we would have a remedy for it. Because is stress a part of life? Yes. We all deal with stress. There are depressive type things that come upon us as human beings, but the blessing is, is that God has a remedy for the trials of this life. Now, does anybody know who this young woman is? Now, this dear young woman dealt with something called depression. Now, this is taken from the New York Post. This says Louisiana College mourns Arlana Miller, who put suicide note on Instagram. So this dear young woman, Alana Miller, she committed suicide. Now, what is suicide? 
It's the taking of your own life. So this woman was so besought by depression that she literally killed herself. Now we need to find out why this woman killed herself. This says, we're not going to read through the, this entire thing, but this says, may this day bring, bring me rest and peace. I have fought this urge since my early teenage years. Now, what urge was this? Suicide, Suicide. Suicide to kill herself. I gave this life all the fight that I had. Jumping down to the middle, it says, to the people in my life, I pray you learn to vocalize your feelings and get help always. I failed at that and I'm afraid it's too late. Mom, thank you so much. I pray you know I'm at rest now. It says, I'm happy in the water where everything is still and peaceful. I have written so many suicide notes in my life, but finally I reached my end. Now going on, it says, I've lost my connection to God. The devil seems to have won. Now it's amazing that this dear young woman was cognizant of the fact that she had lost her connection to God. Now, I wonder if her severing from God was the reason why she fell into this depression. You see, the reality is, is that when we are disconnected from God, this is going to be our reality. Now, we're going to turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59 Isaiah chapter 59, that is a book in the Old Testament for those who are not uh, familiar uh, with the sacred writings. Isaiah chapter 59, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. So God is actually saying, I understand the pain and the degradation that you're going through, and so I hear it, but there's a problem. In verse 2, it says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. So what separates us from God? What causes depression to overtake us? Iniquity. Now, what is another word for iniquity? Sin. Now, we need to understand what sin is. Because do most people understand what sin is? No. There used to be a time where there was at least to a greater or less degree, there was a general understanding as to what sin was, but we live in a very vague society today. And so she says, and that is okay. I blame no one for this. I thank everyone for all they've done. I'm sorry. I am so, so sorry. And it's so tragic to even see this. So tragic. But do you think that she was the only one dealing with these type of issues? No. Not at all. Does anybody know who this dear young woman was? So in light of this topic of depression and suicide, what do you think that this dear young woman did? She killed herself. Now, this dear young woman was in her early 30s. She was either 31 or 32. This was a woman by the name of Chelsea Christ. Mother of Miss USA, Chelsea Christ reveals pageant queen had attempted suicide before. She says, Chris died at age 30 after she fell from an elevated position on January the 30th. It says, we got on a plane. And so this is her mother speaking. We got on a plane, which is now taxiing when the police confirmed that she was no longer with us. Now, this woman, I won't get into the details, but she jumped, I believe, out of the 47th floor of her apartment building. Now, in light of this, do you think that, again, she was the only person dealing with these things? No, she wasn't. Anybody know who this dear young woman was? This was a woman from Stanford University. She was a soccer player. Now, in light of this, what do you think that this woman did? She committed suicide. Now, I, I, I want to be clear. All of these suicides has, have taken place in this year alone. This says she was excited. This says the last couple of days are like parents worst nightmare and you don't wake up from it. So it's just horrific. So these are her parents. They don't know how to deal with the trauma of the fact that their daughter has just committed suicide. Anybody know who this dear young woman was? 
This is another college athlete, medical examiner, James Madison University softball player Lauren uh, Burnett died by suicide. A softball player, a dear young woman who took her own life. Anybody know who this young woman is? Another college athlete all taking place in this year alone. University of Wisconsin track star Sarah Schultz dies at 21. Anybody know who this was? This was a rapper by the name of Little Bo Weep. This woman was only 22 years old and she died, I believe, either of a drug overdose or suicide. Now, this is by no means a condemnation upon this dear young woman, but just looking at her, isn't it evident that she was dealing with internal demons? Very evident. Do you think that she needed the love of Christ to be shown to her? Do you think that she that she needed to understand the message of salvation? You know, when I see young people in this type of situation, I always wonder whether or not there was a faithful, sincere Christian to go to them and to reveal Christ to them. Anybody know who this dear young man was? He was a bodybuilder, bodybuilder, Mr. Universe, Callum Von Mager, hospitalized after jumping from the window. So this man, he tried to commit suicide, but he survived and now his, his spinal cord is severely fractured. Anybody know who this dear young man was? He was a former child star who committed suicide very recently. This is back in 2021, only at the end of last year, a very short time ago. Former child actor Matthew Milder's cause of death at 19 revealed as sodium nitrate toxicity. So this man, this dear young man at the age of 19, he literally ingested sodium nitrate and he intentionally killed himself. Now, all of these dear beloved people, do you think that they, that they had Jesus in their life? Do you think that they have the living water that comes from God? Unfortunately, they did not. This says, this is taking from insider notice. Lonely, burned out, and depressed, the state of millennials' mental health in 2020. Now again, is mental health a serious problem in today's society? It's a very, very serious problem. Now, can we think of anyone in the word of God who, de who dealt with mental depression? Elijah. Elijah. Now, what happened to Elijah that, uh, that uh, spiraled him into depression? The roar of Jezebel. Yes, the roar of Jezebel. So a pagan woman said that she was going to kill Jezebel, and in anguish and despair, Elijah ran to the wilderness. Can we think of anybody else who dealt with depression? Jeremiah. Jeremiah dealt with depression. You know, Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. As a result of all, the, all of the degradation that he saw in Israel, his, he, he wished that his eyes were like a fountain where he could just cry and cry and cry. Does anybody remember King Saul? Did King Saul deal with depression? Yes, he dealt with depression. Now, why did King Saul deal with depression? So he separated himself from God, and as a result of that, the demons of depression were tormenting his soul. Now, what did Saul use as a remedy for his depression? Initially, what did Saul use for his depression initially? There was a dear strapping young man of God who came to him and gave him service. David. Music. Music, yes. You know, there is a very beautiful book called The Ministry of Healing, and I recommend this book to all those who are watching online or who may be watching in the future. There is a chapter in that book, Ministry of Healing, called Mind Cure, and in that chapter it talks about how song is always a weapon that we can use against discouragement. Now, I want to preface this. This is not just any music. You can't listen to Future and 2 Chains and, and, and country music and all these things and think that you're going to banish the demon of depression. There's a certain type of music that banishes demons. Now, what type of music banishes demons? Yes, sacred music. 
that music which is from above, which is first pure and peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated. All right, we're not going to go through all these details. Yes. Would you say Christ? Okay. Yes, Christ did deal with depression. He, yes, he very much did deal with depression. Yes. All right. So when you see this picture, what do you think of? The mind, yes. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans. Let's turn to Romans. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Now is all of this making sense? Yes, Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, actually, can uh, we get somebody to read verse 1 and 2 for us? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So God is saying that in order for us to come into right relation to him, in order for us to be free from these demons of depression or whatever Satan is using to torment us, our minds have to be renewed. They have to be renewed. Now, what does it mean to have a renewed mind? What does that mean? Well, it's being able to have a new way of thinking. Okay. Because okay. in light, you know, light of what you were saying before, you know, especially, you know, reading and hearing, you know, the experiences of even these young people, it's this idea that we have these thoughts and we're, we're relating to these thoughts as if they were our thoughts, as opposed hmm. to what God wants, what Christ wants to give us a new mind is being able to think in a way that he thinks about us and about the realities of this life. Hmm. It's a very good point, yes. Now, notice the statement. This is, again, from the Ministry of Healing. This says, the relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. Very intimate. When one is affected, the other does what? It sympathizes. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. Notice. Many of the diseases from which men suffer are the result of mental depression. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and to invite what? Decay, Decay and death. Now, so in light of all of these discontented thoughts and grief and anxiety, is there a remedy that God gives for all of these negative emotions? Yes, there is. Now, let's turn to Proverbs. Now, remember, we're talking about the living water. Let's turn to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 22. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 22. Does anybody know where I'm going? Proverbs 17, 22. Yes. 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 Can somebody read Proverbs 17, 22? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth up the bones. Yes. So why do you think God is saying this? Is there any scientific, is there a scientific reality to this verse? Yes. yes, literally, physiologically, what happens to the body when you have a merry or rejoicing spirit or disposition? What does it release in the brain? Uh, endorphins. endorphins. All of these different uh, hormones and chemicals are released in the brain that help to fight mental depression and all of these negative emotions. Does it literally do good like a medicine? Yes, yes it literally does. This says, now notice, this is a very powerful statement from a book called The Desire of Ages, one of the greatest books ever written on the life of Christ outside of the sacred volume. This says, he who seeks to quench his thirst at the fountains of this world will drink only to thirst what? You see, the reality is, is that when we do not know God as a personal friend, by default, we're trying to quench our spiritual thirst by going to the world. And we're actually going to find out that there are many things that Satan is presenting to the world as attractive 
that he is actually saying is actually going to fill you, but it's really not going to fill you. Now, let's turn to Hebrews. Let's turn to Hebrews. I want us to get a, a, a broader context and a better understanding of what God is trying to communicate in this passage. So Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. Now, what is Hebrews chapter 11 known for? Yes, the chapter of faith. So some call it the Hall of Fame of Faith. So all of these righteous men and women who lived in times past who were faithful to God, who were faithful to God. Now we're going to start in verse 23. Hebrews 11, verse 23, the Bible says, by faith, Moses. Now, who was Moses? Who was Moses? Yes, he was God's prophet. Now, was Moses, uh, was he uh, of minor importance or of great importance? Great importance. Outside of Christ, Moses is the greatest human leader that has ever existed. I mean, just think about this. The literal fabric and foundation of the civil laws of many countries are based on the principles contained in the instruction that God gave to Moses to give to ancient Israel. Now, does any, has anybody ever heard of the United States Constitution? Yes. Now, of course, we all have heard of the United States Constitution. Now, what document is the United States Constitution based on? The Magna Carta. Yes, the Magna Carta. Now, where does the Magna Carta get its principles from? The Bible, yes, exactly. All of those barons that constructed the Magna Carta in protest against Pope Innocent III, they got their principles from the word of God and specifically from Genesis to Deuteronomy, those instructions that God gave to Moses. So was Moses a very important figure in history? Yes, he was. Now notice what God goes on to say. When he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's what? They were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now, we just want to get some context. What was the king's commandment in this context? What was the command at that time as it pertained to children Moses' age? To, to kill them. So they had to be aborted. I want us to keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that at a later time in this study. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So we all know the story that Moses got adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh. Notice, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a what? So does, is sin pleasurable or is it ugly? Now it is ugly, but does it have pleasure connected to it? Yeah. Yes, it has pleasure. So the reason... According to the statement, why so many of us as human beings go to the world for satisfaction is because we're searching for what? Pleasure. We're searching for pleasure. But where does real pleasure come from? It comes from God. God says, the word of God says that at God's right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. You see, God wants to give us pleasure as well, but it's wholesome, holy Pleasure. And I think this goes yes. back to why you asked the question, you know, about having the new mind. Yes. And why you would desire to have the new mind or even, you know, have that concept is because of that reality. Exactly, exactly. It says everywhere men are unsatisfied. And I'm, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what men are doing, whether they are engrossed in the business world, whether they are engrossed in the music world, whether they are engrossed in the sports world. It doesn't matter how accomplished they may appear to be. They are unsatisfied. They long for something to supply the need of the what? It's even to the point now where secularists and atheists are admitting that man's spiritual nature needs attention. This is why you have staunch atheists like Samuel Harris who practice transcendental meditation because they realize that the spiritual nature of man needs attention. Only one can meet that want, the need of the world, the desire of all nations is what? 
is Christ. The desire as to what man is looking for is Jesus. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of John. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of John. You see, because when these type of statements are made, some people think that you're being arbitrary. There are many religions to choose from. How in the world can you say that Christ is the only way to salvation? Now, let me ask this question. Is there uh, one truth or many truths? There's only one truth. You see, the reality is we live in a society today where we hear the terminology all the time, speak your truth. Has anybody ever heard that before? Yes. Speak your truth. You know, you can have your truth and I can have my truth. Relativity. All of this secular humanism, which essentially asserts that there is no objective truth. You see, we're going to read a very radical statement. Now, let's read in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the what? So Jesus is saying that if you're not connected to me, that you don't have life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by what? But by me. Now, is Jesus saying this arbitrarily, or is he just saying this because this is just the way it is? This is just the way it is. You see, and it's so beautiful when you really understand uh, God's government, when you do thorough biblical research. You see, the reason why Christ says this is not because he's trying to force uh, his opinion or, or anything upon anybody. This is just the way it is. This is just the way it is. If we want happiness, we have to go to the source of happiness, which is Christ. It's the blueprint of life. It says the divine grace, which he alone can impart, is a living water, purifying, refreshing and invigorating the soul. Now, does anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of something called abortion. Now, remember, we're talking about the living water. We're talking about being connected to life, which is Christ. We're talking about being spiritually satisfied. Question. Why is there abortion? sin per particularly what leads to abortion broken homes. broken homes specifically we want to get more specific i promise this is not a trick question sure. though we you know there is a child in the room so we can be discreet but what why does abortion happen Someone what happens yes. what happens Someone says to, counter the, the truth. to counter the truth okay specifically why does abortion happen i promise you Shoot. This is not a trick question. Because somebody makes a choice. To do what? To not have the responsibility. No, no, no. Specifically, what comes before that choice? And are you talking about an action? Yes, an action. How is a man and a woman put in a position where they need an abortion? Or quote unquote think they need an abortion? What has that man and woman done to get to that point? They had intimate sexual relation. Does that make sense? Yes. I, do, don't you see it wasn't a true question? <laughs> well, yeah, but I was just wondering. Okay, so, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, in terms of studying it, you know, yeah. there may be different results of certain situations. Yes. But yes, yes. primarily that's what happened before it. there's a need to do it. Exactly. And, and don't get me wrong. Certainly, it's not in every case of... Uh, in, in regards to leading to abortion, in regards to just, you know, the consenting of two adults. There's rape, there's incest, there's many different things that lead to the point. But there's a reality that there must be a connection between the man's reproduction and the woman's reproduction. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Now, is the vast majority of abortions as a result of rape and incest? No. No. It, actually, it's less than 1%. The vast majority of abortions take place simply because people don't want the responsibility of this. Now, it was mentioned before that this happens as a result of sin. Now, is abortion a new phenomenon? No. Are you sure? Yeah. And you mean like in regards to 
like time period like how long it's been going on did abortion just come to fruition in the united states of america well, or is it a practice that has been going on for centuries well basically say, oh, yes but probably not consensual not consensual all right let's turn in our bibles to the book of first kings i was gonna say is this going back to the thought before in regards to was it moses where you mentioned that's very good that's very very good um, but not necessarily that. We're not going to that point right now. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Kings. Turn our Bibles to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10. We're actually going to read in 1 Kings chapter 11. Does anybody know who 1 Kings chapter 11 is talking about? Solomon. Solomon. Now, was Solomon a righteous king or a wicked king? Now, he died a righteous king, but the vast majority of his middle-aged life, what was he? Up until his older age. He was wicked, unfortunately. Now, was Solomon just, you know, stealing cookies from the cookie jar? Was he, like, super wicked? Yeah, he was super wicked. He even got to the point where even Solomon himself was literally engaging in homosexual activity. Notice. 1 Kings chapter 11, starting in verse 5. The Bible says, For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Now, these were pagan deities. And specifically, these were pagan sexual fertility deities. Now, does anybody know what was one of the major practices of these pagan deities? Now, let's turn to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. We're going to notice the worship of the god Shemash, or as he is demonstrated under a different name. Now, Leviticus chapter 18, starting in verse 21. Now, let's notice some of the things that were associated with these deities. In verse 21, can somebody read verse 21 for us? 1821? Yes. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire up to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. So during these ancient pagan times, what would happen? Ashtoreth, has anybody ever heard of Ashtoreth? Yes. Yes, she was the fertility goddess. And how they consecrated the worship of Ashtoreth, they would literally engage in sexual immorality. So there was homosexuality, lesbianism, incest, bestiality, all of these things would take place in the worship of Ashtoreth. And during that time, was there contraception as we have it today? There was not. There was not. So as a result of all of this immorality, what happened to the women? They got pregnant. They got pregnant. And as a result of that, they would actually consecrate those babies to the god Molech. Has anybody ever seen a picture of the god Molech? It was a very large statue of a pagan deity, and they actually, uh, when you actually see the, the image of Molech, you can actually go and type this up on Google. Molech's hands would be out like this, and they would literally heat the statue of Molech to the point where it got red hot, and they would place those babies on the hands of Molech until the baby died. And this was the form of abortion that was practiced in ancient pagan times. So the reality is that abortion is nothing new. It is a practice that has been around for millennia, many, many millenniums. Now notice, Roe versus Wade leaked draft. So there's very, there's much consternation because people are afraid that Roe versus Wade or the Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion throughout the whole of the United States is going to be revoked. What is Roe versus Wade? Now, when did the Roe versus Wade decision take place? What year? Now, we need to know this. What year? 1973. 1973, before some of us were born. 
So this says Roe versus Wade. What does it refer to? Roe versus Wade is the name of the lawsuit that led to the landmark 1973 U.S. Supreme Court decision establishing a constitutional right to abortion in the United States. Now, I just want to preface this. There's still so much that we have to get through that, unfortunately, I'm just going to have to either cut or condense because we're simply just running out of time. Who are Roe and Wade? We're not going to go through these details. You can rate, read this in your spare time. We're actually going to put um, this presentation up on the Internet on YouTube. Where we're actually going to properly edit it and have all these slides up so you can actually look at this uh, for yourself. All right. Now, has anybody ever heard of Planned Parenthood? Yes, Planned Parenthood. Now, remember, we're talking about the living water. Now, again, if, peop if persons had the living water, which is Christ, would Planned Parenthood be a necessity? No, it would not. Now, does anybody know who this uh, dear woman was? And I say dear, not as a means to extol her, but I say dear as a means of the fact that Christ died for her sins. This is a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger. Anybody ever heard of Margaret Sanger? She is the founder of Planned Parenthood. Does anybody know the ideology that Margaret Sanger had? Notice. This is what she said. This is what Margaret Sanger said. I admire the encouragement of a government that takes a stand on sterilization of the unfit. Now, she was talking specifically about the Nazi regime. Now, who was the head of the Nazi regime? Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler. Now, who was controlling Nazi, the Nazi regime at that time? Well, we're not going to get into that for this evening's study. <laughs> This says, my admiration is subject to the interpretation of the word unfit. So Margaret Sanger believed that if persons were physically, quote unquote, unfit to have children, that it was right to forcefully sterilize them. This was something called eugenics. This is taken from USA Today. Remove statues of Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood founder, tied to eugenics and racism. Now, it's amazing the statements of this woman. Notice. This says, we're not going to go through all the details again for the sake of time. Notice what she says at the bottom. This says, in promoting birth control, she advanced the controversial Negro project. Now, what does the word Negro stand for? Who is that uh, talking about? Is that talking about Asian people? Is that talking about uh, people from uh, Italy? When it says Negro, who is that uh, referring to? That used to be the socially accepted term for persons of, uh, as it were, black African descent who live in the United States. Wrote in her autobiography about speaking to a KKK group and advocated for a eugenics approach to breeding the gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extinction of defective stocks those human weeds which threaten the blooming of the finest flowers of the American civilization. So Margaret Sanger literally believed that we needed to sterilize certain parts of the United States population so that the real um, good people of American society could flourish. Does that make sense? Now notice what she says about the Negro population. Notice. Like abortion... Sanger urged Dr. Gamble to enlist the help of spiritual leaders to justify abortion, writing, no, now these are her words. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out the, that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. And it's so tragic that even black pastors openly encourage abortion. You know, it's amazing. Well, persons will argue, you know, even though, uh, you know, Margaret Sanger was a racist and a eugenicist, that is not uh, what Planned Parenthood is currently about. Planned Parenthood and other abortionist organizations, they're about women's health. They're about progressivism. They're about uh, women's liberation. And all of these things, all of these uh, triggered words that are given in order to justify what they're doing. But the unfortunate reality is this. 
is that sadly this is the deadly legacy of this institution and whether men want to admit it or not this is what they're promoting planned parenthood was founded by a racist white woman this is part of the history that cannot be changed and this is the unfortunate legacy of planned parenthood now are is it just black persons that are affected by abortion no, it affects all classes of society, but we're here just bringing this out for a particular purpose. Now, who is this? This is just a random black woman. This is just a random black woman. Now, the reason why I put up a black woman is because the black woman is actually the most affected by abortion. Does anybody know how many black babies have been aborted since 1973? That, that uh, stance of Roe versus Wade. Take a guess. I know it's in the yes, it's literally in the millions. Now, mind you, black women only make up 6% of the United States population, but make up 40% of all abortions in the United States. Notice, when you see those percentages, it indicates that over 44 million abortions happened since 1973. 19 million black babies were aborted. So since 1973, 19 million black children have been aborted since 1973. Is that a shocking statement? That's a, it's, it's, it's so tragic and sad that this is the reality. Now, do you think that Satan's target is just black persons? The reality is that Satan is trying to literally destroy the entire human race. And this is literally one of the greatest avenues that he has given for the propagation of these satanic ideologies. Yes. In reality, if you think about even with Herod, and I mean, we know in Revelation, you know, twelve, when it yes. talks about, you know, Satan was wrong with the woman, and he went to go make war with the remnant of her seed. That you know, the intensity of Herod wanting to. Very good point. That's powerful. Right? Yes. You know the children just because of the effect of what that child a child would be able to do mm. how much more in light of the reality of what our children can be in christ mm. would he want to destroy you know you know children exactly this is a very very important point you see because and i just actually want to make this uh, statement as well to those who may be watching this who have had abortions, to those who have found themselves in those predicaments, I just want to tell you that Christ does not condemn you. Yes, he is calling you to repentance, but he does not condemn you. You see, Christ understands all of the circumstances that involve our life. He understands the pressures that we have had in our life. He understands everything that has led us to make even the bad decisions that we make. And I'm telling you, Christ is offering healing. Now, there may be some women who may be, who watch this who say, I don't care. I have absolutely no regret, no guilt about the abortions that I had. The only thing I would say is that that is just an evidence of the hardness of where your heart is. But even in that condition, Christ offers you pardon and peace. Now, does anybody know what this is? Now, the reason why the Roe v. versus Wade decision was brought into prominence is because of this. We're coming to a close in our message. Does anybody know what this is? Does anybody know what this dear, dear, actually, before we get into, before we even get into that, based upon the style of dress that these people have, what time period do you think this is? The 60s. The 60s. Now, what were the 1960s known for in the United States? It was known for the something revolution. The blank revolution. Uh, oh, sexual. The sexual revolution. Now, was the 1960s crazy? It was crazy. I know people who lived through the 1960s, and they mentioned that it was crazy. Now, this woman is holding her bra, and she feels liberated because she's now taking off that which to her is a symbol of oppression. And now notice... She's literally objectifying herself. How many women are in that audience? I see just one. I see just one woman. Now notice, she's liberating herself, not in a crowd full of women, but in a crowd full of men. 
So by over-sexualizing herself in front of all these men, she feels liberated. Now, is that liberation? You see, that's actually oppression. You see, the devil is so tricky and wicked that he will make you think that bondage is freedom and that freedom is bondage. Satan will make you think that adultery and promiscuity is freedom and that having a loving marriage is bondage. That's why we need a new mind. This is why we need a new mind. Again, this is Margaret Sanger. Does anybody know who this man was? He was responsible for a lot of adultery that has taken place in American society. A man by the name of Hugh Hefner. Anybody ever heard of Hugh Hefner? He's responsible for an organization called Playboy. Anybody ever heard of that? You know, the term, you know, uh, he's a playboy. Anybody ever heard of that? That came from Hugh Hefner. Now, it's amazing. Hugh Hefner grew up as a Methodist Christian. Do you think that he ended as a Christian? Unfortunately, he did not. Now, does anybody know who this woman was? I forgot her name, uh, pardon, excuse me, but she was one of the great uh, feminist uh, voices uh, during the sexual revolution time. This is another gentleman, I forgot his name. Some people uh, seeing this may actually know who this is. This is a very famous uh, transgender uh, uh, individual uh, during uh, this sexual revolution time. Now, does anybody know who this man is? He is called the godfather of the sexual revolution, a man by the name of Alfred Kinsey. Alfred Kin Kinsey, you could even say, is almost solely responsible for the sexual degradation that took place in the United States. You know, there used to be a time where virginity was actually looked, as, looked at as a good thing before you got married. You know, it's even to the point now where children 14, 15, and 16 are made fun of if they're 16 and not and and uh, still virgins, it's it's seen as a badge of honor to be 14, 15 and 16 and to be sexually promiscuous. Why the sexual revolution needed a sexual revolutionary. So it goes on talking about the legacy of Alfred Kinsey. Now, we're not going to go through all these details simply for the sake of time. But I heavily implore you to do research on this man. This man did such degrading experiments, pedophilia, and all of the debasing things that you can possibly think of. And he literally wrote books advocating the sexual immorality that we see in the world today. All right. He was a homosexual. He was many things. All right. Now, what is this a symbol of? This is a symbol of gay pride. Now, what is the rainbow originally a symbol of? God's promise. God's promise that he was going to restore man back into his image. That was, that's what the rainbow was for. Now, why? Now, mind you, we're talking about the living water. We're talking about this sexual degradation. Now, why do, you, why do you think people get involved in sexual degradation, such as homosexuality, promiscuity, fornication, adultery? Why do people get involved in these things? What are they searching for? False love. They're searching for love. They're searching for the living water, but they don't know it. They think that they're going to find their identity in their sexual orientation. They think they're going to find their, their, their identity in their pronouns. They think that they're going to find their identity in all of these things. But Jesus says simply, if you come to me, you will actually find your identity in me because I am your loving creator. Because question, when you buy a new vacuum cleaner, where do you go to find out how to use the vacuum cleaner? The instructions. The instructions. Now, who made the instructions to the vacuum cleaner? The, one who made the, vacuum. the creator of the vacuum cleaner. So if we're going to find as human beings how to live life happily, joyfully, holy, who should we go to to find that instruction? Our creator. Our creator. Now, some person says, how can you say that the, that the God of the Bible, so-called, is our creator? There's such a thing as Darwinian evolution. Now, mind you, most persons don't even understand that Darwinian evolution is nothing more than repackaged paganism. But that's another study. Go ahead. Yes. 
Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us reason together. All right. I wish we had time to go through all of this. I, I really, really wish we do. Really wish we did. All right. We'll probably get into these details in another study, but for the sake of time, we're just going to get to the specific points. Now, this is an amazing quotation from a book called Unix for Heaven. This quotation goes into the details talking about that in the greco roman world, homosexuals and, and transgender persons were seen as privileged beings. They were seen as the upper echelon of society. In the greco roman world, pedophilia was actually seen as a badge of honor. Do we live in that same society today? Yes, we do. And some people just, you know, spurn it off. You know, that's just, you know, QAnon conspiracy theories. But again, that's, uh, we're not going to touch that for today. All right. Celebratarian churchmen averse to marriage and procreation would have been regarded by the Greeks as, as classic examples of the homosexual species. Now, this is taken from a book called After the Ball. Notice. Now, this was the agenda has anybody ever heard of something called the homosexual agenda? Yes. Now, this encapsulates the homosexual agenda. Notice. Gays must... And I just want to preface, even as we're going through this, us bringing out these things is by no means to attack persons who may identify as homosexuals. You see, the reality is this. Actually, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Will, will there be former homosexuals in heaven? Will there be former lesbians in heaven? Will there be former fornicators in heaven? Will there be former killers in heaven? You see, brothers and sisters, what God is trying to communicate to us so earnestly, it does not matter what our past has been. Jesus' blood is powerful to cleanse us from every sin, from every sin. But the thing is, we have to want the cleansing. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, now notice these words of God. In verse 9, the Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So Jesus says, do not be deceived. Those who are practicing unrighteousness are not going to heaven. You see, it's very popular. I know we've all heard it. When you watch, you know, the music awards and the Oscars and all these things, and people, you know, get Oscars for R-rated movies where they literally were, were having sexual relations, fornicating, and sometimes these actors are married and are fornicating in the movie, and then when they get the Oscar for Best Actor or Best Actress, the first thing that they say is that they want to thank God for giving them the grace and the strength to perform in the movie. Now question, do you think that it's God giving them the ability to commit adultery with that person in the movie? Now some person says, it's just a movie. You're taking it too seriously. You need to calm down. It's not that serious. Now, I, I just wanna be honest. What sane person who is not diluted by certain uh, false thinking would literally be okay with their spouse having sexual relations with another person and just say, well, it's just a movie. I can't be jealous. There should, shouldn't be any strings attached. But now when you make it, we, you, the carnal mind, which is not subject to God, will make it, oh, that's just work. That's just business. You know? Exactly. That's just their profession. That's their exactly. So in verse nine, it says, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice the next statement. And such were some of what? Now, in context, the Apostle Paul is speaking to Christian believers who used to be homosexuals, who used to be fornicators, who used to be idolaters, who used to be drunkards. And he's saying that you all used to practice these iniquities. But notice how you were cleansed from it. Notice. 
but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our what? And by the spirit of our God. You so, so Jesus says, it doesn't matter what sin has you in bondage. I'm powerful enough to give you victory over all of your sins. Because at the end of the day, who's more powerful, God or Satan? God. It's, not, it's not even a contest as to who's more powerful. You see, if, if God was, was vindictive and a tyrant like the devil, God could have destroyed Satan as easily as we throw a stone to the ground. But you see, God is a God of love. God is not going to force us to serve him. Yes, we'll have to suffer the consequences of our own bad actions. But at the end of the day, God wants us to serve him out of love. And so he, he gives us all of the reasons why we should serve him. <laughs> God is so beautiful. Time of reckoning. We're not going to go through all this. Notice this statement from a very powerful book called The Great Controversy. Notice, wherever the divine precepts are rejected, sin ceases to appear sinful or righteousness desirable. Those who refuse to submit to the government of God are wholly unfitted to govern themselves. Through their pernicious teachings, the spirit of insubordination is implanted into the hearts of children and youth who are naturally impatient of what? Now, is our, our, are our young people today out of control? Yeah, I mean, without question. It's not even for debate. And a lawless, licentious state of society results. Do you, Now, again, I don't say this to condemn anyone. But do you know that it's normal now for young people to say that through my sexual experience, I've had 10 partners. I've had 15 partners. I've had 20 partners. I've had 25 partners. That's normal now. That's, that, that's not, you know, just relegated to a certain class of people. That is the norm now. Now, we're not going to go through all this. This is from a show called It's a Sin. This was literally the name of the show. It's a Sin. It's a Sin, a most binge series on Channel 4 streaming service. This is over in the UK. Anybody ever heard of this, uh, dear young man? A gentleman by the name of Little Nas X. His real name is Montero. Something Montero. Now, Little Nas X is a homosexual rapper. And he actually came out with a music video um, that was actually so sexually degrading where he's literally engaging in sexual immorality with a figure uh, disguised as the devil that even some secular people were saying that it was too much. All right, we're not going to go through all these details. Now, does anybody know uh, who this dear woman was? This is a woman by the name of Mary Whitehouse. Notice what she says. She was actually a Christian that lived through the sexual revolution. She wrote a very powerful book called Whatever Happened to Sex. Now, who created sex? God. God. So if God created sex, who should we go to to understand our sexuality? Because are we sexual beings? Yes. You know, and sometimes it amazes me that the God of the universe, who is high and lofty, who is holy, who dwells in light, which no man can approach unto, literally thought that it was so important that he dedicated a whole book of the Bible to sexuality. Now, what is the one book of the Bible that we rarely ever read? Song. The Song of Solomon. And the Song of Solomon, what is the Song of Solomon about? It's about sexual intimacy between a husband and wife because God designed that our sexuality was to be channeled in a God fearing marriage. Well, somebody says that's backwards. I want to spread my wings. Some people even go far as to say I'm too much of a freak to be monogamous to one person. This is literally the language that is propagated. Now, why do you think sexual education from a godly standpoint is so important? Because who is teaching our young people about their sexuality? The devil. 
the devil, school, the music videos, the rap videos, all of these different things. So if at an appropriate time, we're not by the instruction of the word of God, teaching our children about their bodies in a wholesome way, teaching them about the beauty of the sexuality that God has given to them and the blessings of sexual purity and waiting for marriage and the blessing that God wants to give them in marriage. If we're not teaching them these things, who is going to teach them? Satan in the world. Satan so do you think that the church has failed? Do you think Christians have failed in teaching the right principles of sexuality? Yes, we have. It outs us. Now, notice now this this statement is so powerful. The denial of man's role as a child of God is not liberating as the humanists would have us believe. It outs us in bondage to limitation limitations of our own minds and capabilities. You see, when we don't accept God's standard, our imagination comes up with false standards. Man is made so that he cannot ignore God. If he cannot love him, he will do what? He will hate him. It is no mean significance that the secular humanist Marxist philosophy makes the destruction of Christianity one of its main priorities. We have forgotten that love is about giving, not what? Not getting. Not about deadness of spirit and instant gratification. Throughout the 1960s, Britain was punch drunk. On the one hand, a continual stream of advocacy in favor of premarital marital sex, abortion on demand, homosexuality. Psychologists and sociologists came in on the act swept away guilt and with it of course conscience and morality itself so you see especially those of us who are under the age of 35 we've been literally educated in school not to have a conscience as it pertains to our sexuality so this is why i say what we're communicating is by no means to condemn anyone the unfortunate reality is that we have been educated to love immorality We've been educated to love that which is not good for us. The liberators of the 60s have become the tyrants of the 70s. They sneer at fidelity, chastity, commitment to marriage and the family. They glamorize and exalt the one night stand. Now, is the one night stand glamorized in today's society? Yes, it is. Gay liberation and in so doing... They destroy the community and the emotional stability, which is essential to childhood security and social what? And social cohesion. This says, now notice at the bottom, at the very bottom, it says how our sexuality is channeled, whether it is sublimated in service, expressed in love, devalued by the sex cell syndrome or degraded by the pornographers, this will decide the quality of the society in which we live. Isn't that amazing? So this woman, even during this time, was understanding that how sexuality is taught in society will actually dictate the quality of the world at large. So is our society degraded? Has sexuality been falsely advocated? Yes, it has. Now, remember, we're talking about the living water. The reason why so many people think that these things are necessary, the reason why so many people want to engage in this is because they're searching for the living water and they think it can be found in these outlets. All right, this is talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we're going to end right here. Now, what is this? Yes, this is a symbol of the woman at the well, that timeless experience that Christ had with that Samaritan woman. You know, it's so beautiful the way Christ interacted with this woman. Now, let's let, let's get a bird's eye view of this. Let's turn to John chapter 4. Let's turn to John chapter 4. Let's turn to John chapter 4. We're going to take our time a little bit and go through this and understand some of the principles that Christ was... Um, uh, inculcating in this experience with this dear woman at the well. John chapter 4. Because so many times when this story is communicated, um, 
it's expressed in a way that is not authentic to how Christ did ministry. John chapter four, starting in verse, starting in verse uh, six, the Bible says, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to do what? Now, was Jesus talking about spiritual drink or literal drink? Literal. He was, he, Jesus was literally thirsty. He, was, he wanted some real water. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now the reality is that unfortunately, there was great nationalistic antagonism between the Jews and the Samaritans. There was vehement racism between the Jews and the Samaritans. So you see today, the same problems that we have today are the same problems that were happening in Christ's time. All of these sins are, there's nothing new under the sun. Now in verse 10, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who is it that, that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee what? Living water. So Jesus was saying that if you understood who I really was, you would actually be asking of me to give you living water. Now, was this living water physical water? No, the, the physical water was just a symbol of what Christ was trying to give her. The woman said unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Now, you see, the reason why she responded this way is because she did not understand the spiritual importance of what Christ was saying. You see, our spiritual eyes are so dim, we don't understand. From whence then hast thou that living water? So she's inquiring. And this is always the hallmark of a great teacher, is to get the pupil themselves to ask questions. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. So in this instance, was he talking about literal or spiritual water? Literal. literal. So if you drink this literal water, obviously you're going to have to drink again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall do what? You see, Jesus is saying, all of the searching that man is doing, whether in homosexuality, whether in, in music, whether in sports, whether in all of these different things, seeking for satisfaction, finding their identity in all of these things outside of Christ, Jesus is saying is that I want you to find your identity in me. He says, but the water that I shall give, uh, give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into, into what? So Jesus is saying is that if you receive this water, it's actually going to give you everlasting life. It's get going to give you what you're truly searching for. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to do what? So she's thirsting for this water. She wants the water. She wants the spiritual water that Christ is wanting to give. But Jesus has to do something first. What does he have to do? What is her current condition? She's living in what? She's living in sin. And in order for us as human beings to receive the water that Christ wants to give, we can't be holding on to sin and receive Jesus at the same time. There are some of us who may be watching this or who may watch this in the future who want Christ, but we still want to hold on to our sin. We still want to hold on to our bad tempers. We still want to hold on to our cursing. We still want to hold on to our fornication. We still want to hold on to how we talk to our children. We still want to hold on to the fact that we lie and cheat and steal. But Jesus is saying, you can't have me and have these other things at the same time. Maybe they didn't know who Jesus was to be able to choose something 
Exactly. Or it's possible that we received a false Jesus and we were told that we could have sin and Jesus at the same time. That's not Jesus. Notice in verse 16, Jesus saith unto, saith unto her, go call thy husband and come what? <laughs> Did she have a husband? No, she didn't. She was committing what particular sin? You see, Jesus, he's so loving and tender, but he doesn't beat around the bush. When God, you see, God is trying to get sin from us and he gets very specific. He touches our specific sins. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus saith unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. Notice, for thou, have, for thou hast had five husbands and he whom thou hast not is thy husband. Uh, in that saidest thou truly. So she was with how many men? Six, actually. So she had been actually committing adultery with how many men? Six. But there was a seventh husband that had now come to be her satisfaction. And who was that seventh husband? That was Jesus. <laughs> so the man that she was really looking for was who? She was looking for Christ. But notice, how, notice the woman's reaction to the fact that Christ was pointing. Now, did the woman tell Jesus that she was living in sin? How did Jesus know that? Because he was divinity. He was God in the flesh. He was literally turning the chapters of her life. And do you think that she was open to the turning of those chapters? No, she wasn't. Notice verse 19. The woman saith unto him, sir, I perceive that thou art a what? I perceive that thou art a prophet. And so what this woman was actually doing, she tried to quickly change the subject. She tried to quickly change the subject of what Jesus was talking about. But the reality is, did this woman uh, eventually get this living water? Yes, she did. Yes, she did, by God's grace. Now, in verse 27, we're going to jump down. In verse 26, Jesus said, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled. And in verse 28, it says, the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the what? Christ. The Christ. So we didn't go through uh, the, the preceding verses, but the woman repented of her sin. She acknowledged the fact that she was living in adultery and she was willing for Christ to purify her from those sins. And as a result of that, she received that living water. And this is actually an appeal to everyone watching this. Christ wants to give you that living water. He wants to give you himself, but he cannot give you himself while you are hanging on to another husband, as it were. Christ wants to be your satisfaction, but you can't, we can't go prostituting ourselves to other partners and still be in a loving relationship with Jesus. It is impossible. You see, because reality, sometimes we don't understand, God has feelings. God is, is an emotional being, and his emotions are actually far more intense than ours are. You see, when we sin, we actually break his heart. We crack it in half. When we decide to do our own thing and, and spit in his face, it literally breaks his heart. It literally breaks it. But even though it's broken, he still comes back to us and loves us literally as if we've never done anything to him. The unconditional love of God is so beyond comprehension that it's, um, it's, it's unfathomable. Notice, he who seeks to quench his thirst at the fountains of this world will drink only to do what? To thirst again. Everywhere men are unsatisfied, they long for something to supply the need of the what? The need of the soul. Only one can meet that want, the need of the world, the desire of all nations is who? Christ. The divine grace which he alone can impart is as living water, purifying, refreshing, and invigorating the soul. 
Now, how does Christ come and abide in our hearts? How does he do this? Does Jesus uh, literally somehow metaf- metamorphosize his physical body and literally live inside of us? Is that how it happens? How does Jesus live inside of us? Okay, oh, so those are the mechanisms we get, yeah, all of those different things. Now, what specifically actually comes into us that allows Christ's Holy Spirit? Jesus said very clearly in John uh, chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit would be the comforter to abide with us. And what does the Holy Spirit give to us? Now, let's turn to Galatians. Let's turn to Galatians. We're going to end on this point. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Galatians. Yes, let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Notice, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 19, the Bible says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. So the Bible is about to list all of the things that we find satisfaction in. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of what? The kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is number one what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. So what Christ is saying is that I want to exchange your hatred for love. I want to to exchange your unsettled state of mind for peace. Wonderful peace that I can give to you. But Christ says that before I can do this, you must lay your burdens. You must lay your sins at my feet. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yes, please read. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Yes. And in verse 26 it says, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. Now, is it evident that the world needs this living water? Do we ourselves need this living water? And you see, brothers and sisters, it's the only thing Christ is, is, is giving to us is an invitation. Again, Christ is not going to force this upon us, but he is pleading with us to accept this living water. And again, my appeal to everyone watching this, who may watch this at a future time, open your heart to that living water that Christ is seeking to give. Christ wants to exchange your hatred for love and your unsettled state of mind for peace. It does not have to happen in the future. God wants to do that for you now. He wants to do that for you now. Because there are many of us that are possibly at the, at the point or the brink where we may be contemplating suicide. But the reality is that Christ can come into your heart even now and exchange that unsettled state of mind for the peace of heaven. And with that, let us close and have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Dear Father, I just pray that you would please be with everything that was communicated. Dear Father, we weren't able to go through everything in its details, but I know that what you shared with us has been a savor of life unto life. Lord, my soul has been rejuvenated and recharged. The tiredness that I once felt, I don't feel anymore, dear Lord, and I even thank you for that. But on a broader scale, dear Lord, I pray that you be with all the souls, dear Lord, that heard these words. I pray, dear Father, that you be with those who will listen and watch in the future. And I pray that you be with especially those, dear Lord, who are in the valley of decision, who are deciding as to whether or not they should fully surrender their hearts to Christ. Lord, I just pray that they will understand that there is no satisfaction in the things of this world. There's no satisfaction, dear Lord, even in family and friends and all these different things. Though they are a blessing, our soul cannot be satisfied merely by human relationship. 
We need that connection that only comes from having a deep and abiding relationship with the creator of the universe, the creator of you and I. And so, dear Lord, I just pray that you would keep us to this end. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we will not fail nor become discouraged, but that we will seek you earnestly with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I just pray that you would keep us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen.